Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's me, Nicole, your pocket neuroscientist. Today we're gonna to be talking about phone addictions and how we tend to, as I was saying, today we're gonna to be talking about phone addictions and our tendency to keep checking our phones and being distracted by notifications. So listen up, put your phone on silent and let's get into it. But before that, if you haven't liked and subscribed or commented, please do so now. You'll really be helping the channel grow so we can help reach the masses. I think we can all agree that we have a penchant or a penchant, if you're English, for wanting to check our phones as a habit, as potentially an addiction. And we'll get to the bottom today and you can figure out for yourself if that is treading the line. Have you ever forgotten your phone at home or left it in another room and you start to just reach for your phone even though it isn't there. I encourage you to try it and you may even be feeling some level of anxiety now as I'm saying that. I know that I certainly have felt that before. Stay with me, we'll get into the reasons why this happens. I'm gonna first hit you with some horrifying stats. On average, people check their phones around 96 times per day. Now, if you really want to, there is an option to see that on iPhone. I'm not sure if you have an Android, I'm sure there's gotta be an option for that. You can actually check to see how many times you pick up your phone just to even check the screen to see if you've got any messages. That's on average once every 10 minutes. I don't know about you, but that sounds horrifying to me. I should actually check mine. Just one sec, um, pick up. <gasps> Oh my God, I pick up my phone 212 times a day on average. I actually thought this video was gonna be for you, but it turns out it's actually for me. I'm just gonna defend myself and say that I do have an online job. So my daily average is five hours a day, which is a lot, but I do know that if you spend an average of six hours a day, which is obviously still a lot, that is approximately 91 days per year that you spend on your phone. Obviously that's a starking stat. So let me just add to this lovely sandwich that I'm making for you. It takes on average around 23 minutes to get back into a workflow once you've become distracted. So to actually reach a level of deep work, which we'll talk about in a different video, it takes around 23 minutes to be able to reach that level of flow again once you have been distracted. That's pretty wild. So the question we have all been waiting for, is it an addiction or is it just a really bad habit? I think that we can have healthy habits and behaviors around phone use. And so, you know, it's, it's where do we draw the line? And it's gonna be different for everybody. I hate the word moderation sometimes because it requires us to actually know what moderation is. But hopefully once I've explained it, you can then decide for you if you need to cut back or not. So what is an addiction? An addiction is a behavior that is essentially being repeated despite it bringing adverse effects to your life. The difference between an addiction and a bad habit is the degree of control that you have over this behavior and the adverse consequences that it brings. So addictions tend to be more compulsive, whereas bad habits tend to be more voluntary. So I want to check my phone, I don't really care, rather than I'm doing this on autopilot without being able to control myself. An addiction could look like I really don't want to be on my phone, but it's bringing me stress and anxiety and actually causing me pain that I can't be on it. So, you know, bad habits can be hard to break, but they don't bring on this overpowering compulsion to want to keep doing it. So I generally tend to say that if you want to go into a Instagram hole or a TikTok doom scroll, then as long as you're doing it with your eyes wide open, excuse the pun, you're doing it with the intention of wanting to do that and have fun. You know, sometimes I do it and I'm actually having a great time, but it's not impacting my ability to work because when it starts impacting your daily life, your sleep patterns, your mental health, your ability to compare yourself to other people on the internet, that's when you're treading a fine line towards more of a behavior that is not serving you, which is bringing on adverse consequences. So there's one thing I want you to understand, and that is that the first few days when you cut back on your phone use, it will feel weird. You might go through quote unquote withdrawals, but it does pass because one of the underlying themes for dopaminergic activity is that there's this dopamine behavior that says, grab your phone, or engage in the behavior that brings you joy. Right afterwards, Dr. Anna Lemke talks about this in her book, there's a feeling of pain that manifests in the form of, I want more. The more you give in to that feeling of, I want more, this brings me pain, I want more, this brings me pain, 
this kind of seesaw happens between the two. And the more you rock that boat, the more you start to lean towards addiction. And the only way that you can really get through that is to feel the discomfort, to sit within that boredom, the discomfort of wanting to reach for something that you shouldn't be having and eventually letting that feeling pass. Because then what happens over time is that balance starts to reset and it starts to become a little bit of a shift up and down rather than a big kind of peak and a big trough. So the underlying message is that if it feels impossible for you to leave your phone from seven o'clock at night, I personally put my phone away at seven o'clock at night. I sleep much better. I can engage with my family much better. I personally cannot look at my phone past nine o'clock. I do read a lot, but putting my phone away at seven to eight felt like hell for the first few weeks. It was one of the biggest habits to break because you want to check your phone. It feels so nice. It feels so good to just scroll while you're watching TV. But the other side of the coin is that if you do that multiple times, your brain starts to merge activities. So now all of a sudden you can't watch a film without scrolling on your phone because those two behaviors have integrated as the same pattern of activity, which the brain perceives as enjoyable. And without the other, the other one's not as enjoyable. So I want you to understand that even if you're thinking about the fact that I just encourage you to leave your phone at home and it brought you anxiety, it may do so in the beginning until eventually the brain rewires itself and re-regulates itself to be able to live without it. So of course I can't live without my phone, I work online, but I have to have quite healthy and strict rules around my phone use, otherwise it just infiltrates my entire presence, my mental health, my everything. And so I encourage you to do the same. Try it and let me know in the comments maybe how you feel. I did a post on not grabbing a phone for the first hour of the morning, and I cannot tell you the amount of comments that I received saying, oh my gosh, I've been doing this since this post. I've been doing it since you've spoke about it a couple of months ago. So I posted about it a couple of times. And honestly, the stark difference between doing it and not doing it is wild. And there's a plethora of research to suggest that this is good for the brain and good for our mental health. But it's just really nice seeing it from our community anecdotally. So drop it in the comments if you have tried it and let me know because I think it's honestly one of the most underrated tools to improving your productivity and mental health on a daily basis. Brings me to my next point, self-interruptions. What is that, Nick? I'm about to tell you. Self-interruptions are self-generated interruptions. People think that there are external factors that are interrupting them from their focus and their work and their report that they're supposed to be writing. More than 50% of our interruptions are self-generated. And they come in the form of, I'm just gonna check my Instagram real quick. I'm just gonna see if I've got a message. I'm just gonna quickly check my email. Oh, I should actually have a cup of coffee before. Actually, let me quickly go to the bathroom and then I'll work. These self-generated interruptions are the leading cause of our inability to focus. This number is increased when your phone is nearby. A research study that was done at the University of Texas showed that participants had a 20% reduction in working memory just by having their phone in their presence. Why? Because your brain is constantly thinking, I could reach for this at any point. You're looking at me right now, but there are things in my periphery, there are things in your periphery, and your brain is telling you that I'm important right now on the screen but your brain is still blocking out all the things that are in your environment. It's how the brain works. It basically attaches salience to the thing that you are paying attention to. If your phone is nearby, there's going to be a divide on what is important. We call it an attentional capture. So your brain is going to want to revert to the things that are more fun in the environment and work very, very hard at continually bringing you back to focus if there's something that's more fun out there to be engaged with. So just by having your phone in your presence can heavily impact your ability to concentrate on the task at hand. Also because you know that there could be a notification at any point. I've spoken about this before and I've called it mental currency. So my research essentially looked at our perceived idea of a mental break. So what would happen in the workplace is people will be doing their work, then they think, oh, I really need to take a mental break. I'm just gonna go and scroll on social media with the perceived idea that they are taking a break from the task at hand. The problem is, 
that your phone, social media, etc., is still drawing on these cognitive resources, this mental currency. So when you then sit down to work, your decision-making skills are impacted. I know this because that's what came up in my research. And your ability to hold executive control, so that's focus and attention on the task at hand, is also impacted. Have you ever sat down after a break and actually had even more diminished productivity? That is because you probably haven't taken a proper mental break. And the problem with the brain is that it's not really like a muscle where you can feel the fatigue. It manifests itself in other ways. So you start to become irritable. You start to become anxious. Your stress levels start to go up. You start to, to lower your threshold for your ability to withstand stress. So now all of a sudden that hairband that snaps is the straw on the camel's back. And that is because you have essentially spent your mental currency on all these different things, including social media. The question is, is it impacting your ability to make healthy decisions for yourself? Are you coming home from work and thinking, oh, you know what, I'll just order a takeaway yet again, despite the fact that I said I wasn't going to instead of cooking? Are you forfeiting on going to the gym because you're tired? Because this is the kind of hidden activity that takes our mental currency, but we're not paying enough attention to it. We're not talking about it enough. It's so, it, it's almost seemingly innocuous that you don't even realize that it's happening. So make sure that you are aware of where you're spending this mental currency. Be aware that, you know, whilst you, you can take a break and look at social media during work, you're not replenishing that mental currency. And so it is probably going to impact the rest of your work day. I've already touched on dopamine activity, but I'm just gonna get into it in a little bit more detail. So. Every time you reach for your phone and every time you get a notification or you go on social media thinking that you may have gotten a response, a comment or a like, dopamine is released in pursuit of attaining this reward. The problem with this activity is that this behavior, this dopaminergic activity can rise quite quickly and then drop quite quickly as well, which if you engage in a couple of times a day is fine. The problem is, is that this trajectory becomes too volatile over time. And because there's a rebound period, a refractory period where dopamine replenishes in the cell, it means that you need more to feel just as good. So what that leads to is this reward seeking behavior where you're compulsively checking your phone to get some sort of reward. Now the problem is, is that it's a catch 22. It's a double edged sword because yes, it will be providing you with some intermittent dopaminergic activity that will give you a boost of motivation but it will quickly dissipate and then you'll find yourself in the same problem a few minutes later. And as I said earlier, 96 times a day on average, which means once every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, you'll be looking for a boost where you could be in a deep flow working on your report, working on the things you're supposed to be working on. The underlying rule with dopaminergic activity, something I've spoken about extensively in my book Rewire, is that there needs to be effort in attaining the reward. So when we work on long-term goals, when we work on things that release quote unquote slow dopamine, it just means that dopamine still rises, but it remains higher for a longer period of time instead of having this volatile up and down activity that is accompanied by quick fixes like checking your phone, eating sugary sweets, smoking, drinking, etc. So by understanding this behavior, we can start to see why by the end of the day, you may be compulsively checking your phone. And I've already explained three things. So number one is that it's the volatile highs and lows that are going to want to keep you in this reward seeking type behavior. Number two, we need to sit in that discomfort of knowing that we want more to rebalance our system. And number three, initially this habit, whichever habit you choose to adopt, whether it's not checking your phone first thing in the morning, using it less at night, putting it away an hour before bed, you choose the habit, it's going to feel difficult in the beginning, almost like you're going through withdrawals, but it will absolutely get easier within a few hours, within a few days. If you have ADHD, please leave a comment below because I want to film a video specifically to you for ADHDers so that I can get into a bit more detail as to how this impacts you. If you haven't liked, subscribed, please do so now so that you can help grow this channel. If you have any questions, drop them in the comment below because I will be answering questions every week. Is it a phone addiction or is it a bad habit? Now that you have the tools and I've given you the knowledge, you decide, is it an addiction or a bad habit? It's me, Nick, your pocket neuroscientist.